I think it's very likely that if you and I were to meet this coming week and enter into just general conversation, that probably many of you would say things like, well, I, I'm trying to live the Christian life. I am. I, I'm trying to be a good Christian. Now, isn't that true? That I think you've probably even used that phrase, some of us here. We've talked with someone whom we know is interested in Jesus too, and we've said that kind of thing. We, we don't want to appear too holy or too saintly or too religious. And so we tend to say, well, I am trying to live the Christian life. Or maybe we feel we don't quite measure up to perhaps what they think a real Christian is, so we use that kind of wording. Well, I'm doing my best to be the kind of Christian that God wants me to be. And you know, it's like saying, well, I, I'm trying to be an Irishman. <laughs> well, I, I am. I'm trying to be a good Irishman. I'm really American, but I'm trying to be a good Irishman. Well, I am. I, I'm doing the best to be the best kind of man that God wants an Irishman to be. You know it's a bit like that. It's all the trying in the world. Won't make you a Spaniard if you're not a Spaniard. Won't make you a Venezuelan if you're not a Venezuelan. All the trying in the world won't make you an American if you're not an American. Unless you're born a Spaniard, unless you're born an Irishman, unless you're born an American, all you can do is imitate the characteristics of those people. That's the only place that trying will ever get you. You know that's what we've been sharing over these past weeks. That that's what nominal Christians do. They try to be Christians. And they try to become part of the Christian community so that perhaps God will accept them along with the crowd. Or they try to believe what Christians believe. Or they try even to do what Christians do. But all the trying in the world will not make you a child of God unless you're born a child of God. All the trying in the world will only result in you being outwardly like a Christian, but not inwardly. And really what we've been saying is, becoming a Christian, or becoming a child of God, or coming into a personal relationship with the person who has made us all here, is not a matter of trying. It's not a matter of trying to do what human beings can do. It's a matter of God doing what he has promised to do. And really, that's the only way you can ever become a child of God, if God does what he promised to do in your life. So what we're saying is, there are Christians, and then there are Christians. There are Israelites, and then there are Israelites. And the mark of the one is that they are, and the mark of the other is that they try to be. And you remember we used the example that Paul gives here about Abraham, how God promised Abraham thousands and thousands of descendants. And old Abraham was 85 years of age, and Sarah, his wife, was 75, and they had no children. And God promised, I will give you a son, and I will give you thousands and thousands of descendants. And Abraham got the idea that he should try to bring about God's promise by his own effort, 
So he went to bed with Hagar, his wife's maid, and they produced Ishmael. And Ishmael was called the child of the flesh. Not because it was sexy or something like that, but just because they, he had been produced by human effort, by man and woman doing what they could do to try to bring about God's will. And then you remember about 10 years later when Abraham was 100 and Sarah was 90, God gave them the gift of Isaac by miraculous birth when Sarah was way beyond the age of bearing children. And Isaac was called the child of promise because he was brought about by God's supernatural work. Now, loved ones, that's what real Christians are. They're children of promise. They're children who have come about not by their own efforts, not by trying hard to do what God wanted them to do, but by God doing a supernatural work in them. And that's the basis of Isaac's life, and it's the basis of the lives of those of us who are personally related to our Creator, Epangelia. That's the basis. For some, it's Shiva's regal. For some, it's Seagram's. For some, it's marijuana. But for those who are personally related to their Creator, it's Epangelia. It's promise. Promise is the basis of our life. It's God doing what he said he would do in our lives. That's the whole basis of our lives. That was the basis of Isaac's birth. What God alone could do. You can see that, loved ones, if you look at Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews 11 and verse 11. It's page 1051. Hebrews 11 and verse 11. By faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive even when she was past the age, since she considered him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one man, and him as good as dead, were born descendants as many as the stars of heaven and as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. That's it in verse 12, you see. Therefore, from one man, and him as good as dead, were born descendants as many as the stars of heaven. That was the basis of Isaac's birth. Humanly speaking, there was no way, no way that Isaac could have been born. Sarah was by that time 90 years of age. There was no way, humanly speaking, from the point of view of human effort, that Isaac could have come into the world. Isaac came into the world by God doing what he promised to do. He promised he would create in the womb of a woman who was nearly dead a new child, a new baby. And that's the basis of all God's work. And loved ones, the two factors are mutually exclusive. Human effort and God's work. They're mutually exclusive. They really are. If you think you can do it by your own effort, God isn't free to do it. If you think you can do something by your own human effort, God will not be free to work. Only if there's absolutely no chance of it happening from a human point of view, and only if you see that, is God actually able to work. Now, here's why I think a lot of us end up nominal Christians. I'll tell you. I think a lot of us accept only the commandments in the Bible that we can obey by our own power. I think we do. I think a lot of us accept only the commandments in this book that we can obey by our own power. Now, in other words, look at Matthew 5. And I can give you an example just in uh, the same verses. Matthew 5. And it's verse 21, it's page 838, Matthew 5 and 21. You have heard that it was said to the men of old, you shall not kill, and whoever kills shall be liable to judgment. 
I think probably all of us accept this. Because many of us might have wanted to kill our wives, but we haven't killed them. And few of us have really thought seriously of murder. And so we accept that command. And we know that we can do that by our own effort. The next command, we ignore or rationalize. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be liable to judgment. That one we rationalize away. In other words, I think many of us end up nominal Christians, people who are trying to do what only a supernatural work of God will bring about in us. We end up nominal Christians because we accept only the commandments in the Bible that a self-disciplined theist like Socrates could, with a little bit of willpower, obey. And so we accept only the commandments that we can obey by our own power. It's the same if you go down a few verses to 27. Verse 27. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. And many of us accept, yeah, that's a command of God. We shouldn't commit adultery because by dint of cold showers and willpower and reading the right power of positive thinking books, we can avoid committing adultery. So we can do it by our own human power. And we accept that as a command of God. The next verse, we rationalize away. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. In other words, we do the same as old Abraham. We say to ourselves, well, this old wife of mine here can't bear a child, but maybe that young maid can. And so we do what we're able to do by human effort. And that's how we continue to be nominal Christians for the rest of our lives, always trying to be a good Christian, always trying to live the Christian life, always trying to be what God wants us to be, but always finding that it means we're not our true selves. It means somehow we don't do what comes naturally. We're always living a kind of life that seems alien to us. It doesn't seem spontaneous. The reason, of course, is that it's not spontaneous, and it is an alien life, because we're only nominal Christians trying to do what we can by our own human effort. And we get into that position, loved ones, because we refuse to see the kind of life that God actually requires of us. For instance, some verses we ignore completely. Galatians 5. If you look at it, we ignore it completely. We have all the theological justifications, of course, that we're saved by grace, and uh, we can disobey to the end of our lives, but it's really hard to get around this one. Uh, Galatians 5 and 19. It's page 1015. Galatians 5 and 19. Now, the works of the flesh are plain, fornication, impurity, licentiousness, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, anger, selfishness, dissension, party spirit, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and the like. We read that far. We say, yeah, those things are bad, and I am free of sorcery. And... Uh, <laughs> and... Now that Richard is no longer president, party spirit, and so, and so we go on. But loved ones, what we don't see is the next verse. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. And we tend to ignore that. Even though our own lives are constantly plagued by envy and jealousy, to say nothing of anger and selfishness. And we read those verses, and we see, I warned you as I warned you before, that those who do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God, and we ignore that. I think that's how many of us remain nominal Christians. Because, loved ones, the only way to become a child of God is to see that on your own you cannot do it. The only way is to see that this is impossible. Sarah is 90. I cannot have a child by this woman through my own human effort or through her human effort. By my own human effort, 
I cannot be free from anger and selfishness and envy and jealousy. I cannot. I cannot come to a place where I no longer lust after a woman after her in my heart. I cannot come to a place where I can avoid anger at all times. I cannot, by my own power, produce this kind of life. And that's the beginning of wisdom. And it's the beginning of moving into a place where God can do something for you. Because that, of course, is what God has been saying all along. The Father has been saying, you cannot, you cannot do anything that would please me by your own efforts. And when you come to that place, loved ones, that's just on this side of the new birth. When you come to the place where you look at Jesus' life, and you see it there, free from any impurity, free from any uncleanness. And you say to yourself, I cannot be good like that. There is nothing good like that in me. That is in my flesh. That is, as far as my own effort is concerned, or my own willpower, there is nothing in me that is good like that. I can will what is right, but I cannot do it. When you come to that place, you're near to the position that God wants you to get into, where he says to you, do you see that you're just rotten, that there's nothing I can do for you but to destroy you and to start all over again? And when you say that to him, when you say, Lord, I know that, I know that, I know I can't be what you want me to be by my own power, Lord, will you wipe out this life now, wipe out what I am, I know that you have crucified me with Christ. That's what God says. You have died with Christ, and your life is hid with Christ in God. And when you say that, then God is able to make his promise real. And what he does, of course, is he sends the spirit of his son into your life. Now, loved ones, that's in Galatians 4, and it might be good just to look at it, because I think some of you really don't see that it is the center of the new birth. It's Galatians 4 and verse 6, and it's page 1014. And you see Paul is describing what happened to him himself, and he says in verse 6, and the spirit of his, and because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. And loved ones, that's it. If you come to the place where you say, Father, I have not that kind of spirit inside me, would you wipe out the kind of spirit I have, and would you start all over again? Then God sends the spirit of his Son into your heart. And that spirit wants spontaneously to be kindly, wants spontaneously to be patient, wants spontaneously to be love. And so the basis of the beginning of the Christian life is the same as the beginning of Isaac's life. It's a supernatural new birth, and that's the only place to start. So, loved ones, when you see the laws of God in the Scripture, don't draw back from them and rationalize them away. Look at them plainly and see, yeah, you're not like that. And the only way for you to become like that is for God to make you like that. Now, here's the miracle. Once you begin that life of promise, that's the way your life will continue. In other words, a child of God, one who is personally related to their maker so that you know him personally, a child of God lives the rest of their lives by the promises of God, by what God will do in their lives. What are Christians? Christians are people who have given up the right to their own lives and therefore the right to defend their lives, or the right to advance their lives, or the right to prosper their lives in any way. They're people who have given up their lives, who regard themselves as dead, and their life has ended, and anything that they now do is up to the Father. Now, that's the description, loved ones, that you get in Hebrews, if you like to look at it. It's the description that God gives in Hebrews 11 of His children. And of course, it can only be real if you've come to that place where you've given up the right to your life and the right to live it as you please. Hebrews 11 and verse 32. And what more shall I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, 
of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, received promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched raging fire, escaped the edge of the sword, won strength out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Women received their dead by resurrection. Some were tortured, refusing to accept release, that they might rise again to a better life. Others suffered mocking and scourging, and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were killed with the sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, ill-treated, of whom the world was not worthy, wandering over deserts and mountains, and in dens and caves of the earth. Not too preoccupied with whether they got the new 78 model or not. And not even all worn out about whether they would get a vacation this summer. And not even all wrought up about whether they would actually get the degree. Loved ones, children of God, are people who have stopped worrying about the things that society worries about. Children of God are people who have at last been freed from having to burdensomely plan what they're going to do next. Children of God are people who live by God's promise. They didn't expect themselves to be alive. They accepted that the only right they had was to be crucified and killed, and suddenly they find themselves alive. That's what it's like. It's like you, you remember I've shared it before, where you come here and you die. That's it. You die. You just come here and die. And you're willing to die. And you lie down there on the stage. And you've died to your possessions. No longer does it matter whether the car ever is repaired. No longer does it matter whether you get the new carpet. No longer does it matter whether everybody thinks your coat is nice. You're dead to your possessions. They're as far as the east is from the west. You're dead to your relationships. You're dead to what people think of you. No longer does it matter what the professor thinks of you. No longer does it matter what your friend thinks of you. You're dead to your relationships. And you're dead to your future. There is no future. You're dead. Your only future now is with God. And then we all go out of here. And during the night, Jesus comes in. And his spirit comes into you and lifts you up. And you stand up. And you go out tomorrow morning, and we meet you, and we say, you're looking well. And you say, no, no, I've died. And my, <laughs> my life is hid with Christ and God. And this life I'm living, not my myself, but Christ is living in me. And I'm living this life by the faith of the Son of God. A child of God is a person who has experienced that. And so they're suddenly surprised that they're still alive. But the world is no longer theirs to use as they please. It's God's to use as he places. So they live their lives by the promises of God, by what God tells them he's going to do with them. That's it. It's not that they're passive people. They're very active people, but they're active in response to God's directions. It's not that they don't take initiative, but they only take initiative as God's spirit inside them directs them. And so they live by the promises of God. So they don't live like ordinary people. And that's what the Father says. If you like to look at it in James 4 and verses 13 through 15. James 4 and verses 13 through 15. It's page 1056. 1056. James 4 and verse 13. Come now, you who say, Today or tomorrow, we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and get gain. Whereas you do not know about tomorrow. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and we shall do this or that. People who are related to the Creator don't live that way. They don't say today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and get gain. Because we don't know about tomorrow. And we know we're only a mist that passes. And we only do what the Father tells us to do. And so we live by his promises. Not by what he promises. We're not all caught up with what he promises. 
we're caught up with his promises. We know that he has a plan for us here in this life, and we're caught up with his faithfulness that he'll do what he put us here to do. So we're caught up with his promises and his faithfulness to his promises, not what he promised. Do you see that? Children of God are not caught up with what God promises, but with his promises. You can see it with Abraham and Isaac. God promised Abraham and Isaac descendants as the sea, a sand upon the seashore. And they saw that that was what he was bringing about when he miraculously created Isaac in the womb of a woman who was 90 years of age. And so they saw the promise was being fulfilled, and then the incredible thing happened. And you'll find it in Genesis 22. Genesis 22. So they were excited, you know, because it seemed, yeah, we can see. We can see how God is going to bring this about. And then Genesis 22, the unthinkable, really. Page 16 it is. After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here am I. He said, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering upon one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. Of course, it was unthinkable, because this was the son that they believed God was going to use to fulfill his promise. But you see, they weren't caught up with what God had promised, but they were caught up with God's faithfulness to fulfill his promises, and that he would undoubtedly do that in his way. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his ass, and took two of his young men with him, and his son Isaac. And he cut the wood for the burnt offering, and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. Then Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the ass. I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac his son. And he took in his hand the fire and the knife. So they went both of them together. And Isaac said to his father, Abraham, my father. And he said, Here am I, my son. He said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they went both of them together. That's the way God's children operate. They have such complete faith that their father will fulfill his promise that even when the appearances seem utterly contradictory to the possibility of that promise being fulfilled, they continue to move as God had guided them because they are utterly convinced that he will fulfill his promise. He will find some way to bring it about. And you notice, all Isaac said is, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And he didn't protest. When God answered through Abraham, God will provide, Isaac accepted. That's the way God's children operate. Because the spirit of his son is in them. And that spirit soars above the jeers of the Roman soldiers and the insults of the crowd, and that spirit sees the Father up there waiting for him, and that spirit cries out, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. And that's the spirit that moves in God's children. And they know that even if God has to raise Isaac from the dead, God will fulfill the promise that he made to Abraham and Isaac. So, God's children live by God's promises, independent of circumstances. They are not swayed this way and that way by circumstances. They do not operate by circumstances. They operate by God's promises. Indeed, if they ever get into trouble, it is because they take their eyes off the faithfulness of God and look at the circumstances. And there was an example of it, remember, if you'd like to look at it, loved ones, in Matthew 14. Matthew 14. And it's page 847, 848, and Matthew 14, and verse 28. And you remember they were on the lake, the disciples, and then they saw Jesus, and Matthew 14 and 28. And Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, bid me come to you on the water. 
he said, come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. And God's children walk on water. They walk by God's promises. And then verse 30, but when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him. But God's children do not look at the circumstances. They don't listen to the sound of the waves. They don't feel the water under their feet. They look to God's faithfulness, and they keep going that way. And their life is governed by what God wants to do. And that, loved ones, is the heart of the verse that we're studying today. You, you can see it in Romans 9, and I don't mean I'm just starting, I'm really coming to the end. Romans 9 it is, and it's verse 10. Romans 9 and verse 10. And it's page 984. And not only so, but also when Rebekah had conceived children by one man, our forefather Isaac. How did Isaac get Rebekah? Well, went round the bars, you know. Watched. <laughs> Watch out for the best looking girl. Or, you know, maybe he didn't go into bars, but he went to the party and looked out for the best looking girl. Or went to the prom and watched out for the best looking girl. Or went to the church and looked out for the best looking girl. No, you know, it just wasn't that way. The children of God do not depend on their partners for their significance or their happiness. And so they're free at last to go only by God's promises, and they depend on God completely that he will fulfill his promise. And that's what God has promised to do in regard to marriage. God has promised that he has a person for you and that he will lead you to that per per person. And you don't need to worry. You don't need to look at circumstances and see, oh, I'm 35 and I haven't found that person yet. You don't need to look at that. God will keep his promise to you as he kept his promise to Isaac. And that's how Isaac got his girl, Rebecca. Abraham sent a servant out to find a wife for Isaac. And you remember the servant came to the well. In fact, if you look at it, we could just read it, and it might reassure those of us who are 35. <laughs> Genesis, Genesis 24 and verse 42. Genesis 24 and verse 42, and it's page 19. Genesis 24 and verse 42, and... It's uh, Abraham's servant telling the story. Verse 42 of Genesis 24. I came today to the spring and said, O Lord, the God of my master Abraham, if now thou wilt prosper the way which I go, behold, I am standing by the spring of water. Let the young woman who comes out to draw, to whom I shall say, Pray, give me a little water from your jar to drink, and it will say to me, Drink, and I will draw for your camels also. Let her be the woman whom the Lord has appointed for my master's son. Behold, I had done speaking in my heart. Before I had done speaking in my heart, behold, Rebekah came out with her water jar on her shoulder. And she went down to the spring and drew. I said to her, Pray, let me drink. She quickly let down her jar from her shoulder and said, Drink, and I will give you a camel's drink also. So I drank, and she gave the camel's drink also. Then I asked her, Whose daughter are you? She said, The daughter of Bethuel, Nahor's son, whom Milcah bore to him. So I put the ring on her nose and the bracelets on her arms. Then I bowed my head and worshipped the Lord and blessed the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who had led me by the right way to take the daughter of my master's kinsman for his son. And then in verse 50, Then Laban and Bethuel answered, The thing comes from the Lord. We cannot speak to you bad or good. Behold, Rebekah is before you. Take her and go, and let her be the wife of your master's son, as the Lord has spoken. That's the way God's children operate. They go by God's promises. And God has promised that he will prepare the way before each of us here in this room. And he will deal with us in regard to our marriages, in regard to our jobs, in regard to our futures, in regard to all those things to which we have died, but to which society looks for its security and significance and happiness. God will be faithful to us, and God will keep his promises. And loved ones, we are people who live by God's promises. And that's the way we live, not by our own hopes, not by our own wishes, not by our own attempts to do what we can in this life, but we ask the Father, Lord, 
what do you want to do with our lives? And then when he tells us, we rest in complete assurance that he will bring those things about. And he will. I would encourage any of you who have not stepped out on the promise of God in regard to healing to come tonight. We'll have a healing service after the evening service up in the lounge. And if any of you have never grasped God's hand in regard to his promise about healing, then I ask you to come and grasp it tonight and we'll anoint you with oil and move into belief for healing of your sickness. But it's the same with all the things. How many of us here are caught in all kinds of problems in our jobs and our families and our marriages and our romantic relationships? Loved ones, God expects you to live by his promises. And he has promised that he will see you through these things. And he expects you to live off his promises and not the circumstances. I pray that you'll begin to do that and start right at that miraculous birth. Give up trying to do the thing yourself and trust him to do it. Let us pray. Dear Father, we see that you intend us to live by your power and not by our own. And Lord, we produce such a poor imitation of what you have in mind for us when we try to do things by our own power. Lord, we would accept that we cannot. We cannot be free from anger or envy or jealousy ourselves. Lord, we see that there's nothing to be done but for us to die with Jesus. And then will you bring to life in us your spirit that automatically and spontaneously lives as you want so that we may begin this exciting supernatural life of living by the promises of our Father and seeing them fulfilled. We ask this, Lord, so that you'll be pleased with us and so that we will fulfill the purpose that you put us here to fulfill. And now the grace of our Lord Jesus and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each one of us now and evermore. Amen.